All right. Did everybody have a chance to grab? I heard there was coffee and brownies in the back. Is that right? Nick, that's the least you could do for me, if I'm being honest, man. So I'm, on, I'm following Jay and Kurt before that. You're wearing a three-piece suit. I mean, I'm, I'm going to do my best, but I feel like I was set up for failure right from the very get-go here. But at least... This is why I go first. Dang, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's your show. It's, it only seems fair. And uh, after our, our first meeting last November, I, I feel like maybe you're trying, to get, you're trying to get back at me a little bit. That's all right. That's all right. I'll do my best. Um, I, I tell you what, Jay, are you still in here? Yeah. Dude, check shirt, Chuck Taylor's sport coat. I had to leave my sport coat on my chair because you, you stole my whole, my whole deal. <laughs> All right, those are the last bitter words I have to say to you guys. I, I promise. I promise. Um, I'm going to do my best to kind of stay on the script that I had planned coming into this, but um, to be frank, I, I don't have a lot to add that's new or novel relative to what's been said here already today. I mean, between uh, Jim's message and Kurt's message, and Ali, what you were talking about earlier with fitness and, and the seven stages, which were brilliant, by the way. I don't think I've ever seen them quite like that. I, I don't have a lot of new stuff to say other than everything that's been said on here today, I wholeheartedly agree with, and I would just maybe like to reinforce. Um, and I don't feel too badly about that because I, I think the consistency and the redundancy of the messages is maybe a good thing. Uh, because one thing that I've learned, I've learned a lot through my transition process and over the last five years of, of working at Team Red, White, and Blue and working with th literally thousands of veterans, um, one thing I've learned is that the, the secret to this whole thing is that there's no secret. There's no secret. We were just talking just, just a minute ago about health and wellness, and I was like, the secret is broccoli. You know what I mean? It's not a pharmaceutical, like, eat spinach, exercise regularly. It'll be amazing how well it works out for you. There's, there's no secret to this stuff. You've got to put in the work. You've got to be aware. You gotta make steps forward, and, uh, and things tend to work out really well for you when you, when you own this. And so I actually, the title of my slide originally was gonna say, Own Your Transition, uh, but then Nick said, Own Your Shit, and I thought that was better. So I was gonna, I was gonna like hashtag Own Your Shit, and then I was like, no, I'll just make that part of it. And so the three words, and these are just really derivations of, again, what's been said here already today, but the three words that I just beat like a drum and I try, to keep, I try to keep everything simple because I'm really not that smart. Everything's in threes in my world. And at, at Team Red, White, and Blue, we believe in something that, I, frankly, I just kind of made up. Um, but it's called the enrichment equation. And we really feel like a rich life, at its core, consists of three major components. And I call them health, people, and purpose. And at a lot of transition seminars that people go to, we talk really exclusively about employment and we talk about education. And I'm not gonna stand here and act like education and employment are not important because when I got out of the military, I, I went back to grad school and I got a good job and I'm grateful for both of those things. And so those are important, but as, as Nick really said very well in the first session, those aren't the only things. And I would, I would say actually there's like a bedrock that lays below that and I think it's, it's taking care of your health, your relationships, and finding that sense of purpose. And so I'm just gonna drill down a little bit deeper on a lot of what was already said here today. So that guy in the middle, that's me, in case you couldn't tell. There was no gray hair back then. Um, I was about 20 pounds heavier. My, my muscles were much bigger. I did a lot more bench press back then. Um, but the reason I wanted to put this, this slide here is because to me what it represents is something that's been a reoccurring theme throughout my life and uh, certainly throughout my military transition and that is this idea of expectations. So what you guys don't know is this, this photo was taken on June 2nd of 2001. That's the year that I graduated from West Point. I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Army that day. And uh, it was uh, just, uh, George W. Bush had just been elected. But during my time in school and during my training, it was kind of the Clinton era Army. The, the military was drawing down. We were sort of doing some cleanup work in Bosnia and Kosovo. And uh, if I'm really being honest, I didn't join the army to go fight uh, in the sands of Iraq or in Afghanistan. I joined because I couldn't afford to go to Duke, which is where, really where I wanted to go because my parents didn't have any money. And West Point afforded me an opportunity to get a world-class education and not have to pay for my college. And so that's, that's why I joined. I'm not like a lot of the people here in this room who joined after 9-11 knowing that they were going to go to war. I was not one of those people, and I don't mind admitting it. 
And this guy right here in the middle thought, I'm going to go off to Fort Hood, Texas. I'm going to drive some tanks. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to shoot some big 120 millimeter cannons. I might catch some grad school down at the University of Texas. I'm definitely going to go party on 6th Street. It's going to be rad. And uh, I'm, going to do my, I'm going to do what I owe the Army. Thanks for my education. Appreciate it. And I'm going to punch out. And I'm going to go get a job like a grown-up. And I'm going to move on. That was my plan. That was my expectation of what my time in the Army was going to be like. And then about two months later, I was standing in the St. John's Motor Pool in Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, being timed on the assembly and disassembly of the 50 caliber machine gun um, and a couple of planes at the Twin Towers, and my, my whole life changed. The whole trajectory of my life and everything about it changed. And so I learned then, and I've unfortunately had to relearn a lot, that um, your plan and your expectations don't always shake out exactly the way you thought. And so this sort of begins. That's, that's one transition in my life that was really important. And I thought I should point it out um, before we talk a little bit about kind of the post-military transition. Because I think the pre-military transition actually plays into that a lot as well. So I'll fast forward here a little bit, but not too long after that photo was taken, I go to Fort Hood, Texas. We get sent over to, uh, to Baghdad, Iraq. I spent almost the entire year of 2004 there. Um, you know, as a, as a 24, 25-year-old barrel-chested scout platoon leader, did about 300 mounted and dismounted combat missions and uh, had what I think we would describe as a, as a good deployment. Um, you know, all, all, my, all my guys made it home. And that was, that was really the definition of a good deployment, right? We used to say that a, what's, the, what's a good parachute jump? The one you walk away from, right? That's a successful jump. And my expectation of a successful deployment was everybody gets home. And uh, I had, I had uh, a couple guys get, get beat up a little bit. I had one guy lose a leg below the knee. Um, but we all, we all made it home, and I felt like it was a pretty good deployment. Um, and, but something really pivotal happened on that deployment um, was I, I had a chance to work with these guys from the 5th Special Forces Group out of uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and they were, they were just studs. And I was blown away. I, I couldn't believe how efficient and how professional these young Green Berets were. But more importantly, how, how much they were getting done on the battlefield. I felt a lot of days like I was just driving around Baghdad waiting for something to go boom. That sucked real bad. I, di I didn't like it. I felt like I kicked a lot of doors in the middle of the night just to have like screaming women and children behind the door and, and feeling like shit the next day because my intel was terrible because I didn't even have an interpreter. I didn't have doors in my truck either, but that's a whole different story. But I met these, I met these Green Berets and they were amazing and I thought, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really love this war, but I, I love soldiers. I love making a difference, and I feel like if I could come back here and I could do that, then maybe I could, I could move the ball forward. And this, this horrific scene of what's going on here in Baghdad and Fallujah, we could turn it around. And so the month I got home from my deployment to Iraq, I went to, uh, I went to Special Forces Selection, much to the chagrin of my wife at the time, but we'll come back to that. Um, and I was fortunate enough to make it through Selection, and a couple years later, which you've alluded to, right, two long years later of training and education, I end up on a, on a Special Forces Operational Detachment, and um, I'm commanding these Green Berets that I, I revered so much. And uh, it wasn't very long until I ended up here. Anyone know where that is? So that's, that's southern Afghanistan. That's Kandahar. That's actually right outside Mullah Omar's compound, where the, the first big raids went in, when the, when the Green Berets and, the, and everybody went in after 9-11. After and uh, it might as well be the moon. Like, how different does that look than anywhere? I mean, maybe if you went to, like, the middle of Nevada, it would look a little bit like that. But it felt, it felt like the moon. And, uh, and my time there was not at all like my time in Iraq. It, was, uh, it felt backward. It felt confusing. Uh, it was hard. And, uh, and coming home was going to be a bit of a, a shock to the system, I could tell, before I even started my redeployment process. And so if you kind of follow these pictures along, there's, the first slide is the only slide that has words. I don't really like making slides, so I just have some photos to show you guys. There's like some of my family on vacation later and stuff. It's no big deal. Um, but you can kind of see the progress, I think, or, or the regressions in, in some cases of what, of what the story looked like. So this is sort of what I was hoping for when I showed up. This is me in a, in a village way up in the middle of nowhere, about 90 kilometers from the nearest good guys uh, in Aruzgan, Afghanistan. And uh, 
After about a month there, we started getting some traction. We were actually working well with the locals. We had a, a bad situation with the Taliban near our fire base, but we were kind of beating them back. We were establishing some security. Some people felt like they could come out again. As you can see, if you look really closely, my right hand's on a, on a frag grenade. <laughs> so I was, I was happy to be hanging out with these kids, but I, didn't, I wasn't that happy. Um, right, but this is what Green Berets do. I felt, I felt so, so stoked that I was there with my beard and my baseball cap. And, uh, and, we, and we, were, we were gonna really get the populace to believe in what we were doing and, and we were gonna teach them to do it for themselves so that someday we could go home and, and, and high five and have beers and, and talk about what studs we were. And uh, if you just sort of progress through here, uh, this is another village. These are, these are Hazara people um, in central Afghanistan. They, they look a lot, they look sort of Mongolian, more Asian because uh, they're actually a repressed minority in Afghanistan. The Pashtun, the, the ruling class really sort of put them down and through their repression, they be, actually became very resilient and they had better schools, they had a hydroelectric plant, they had really learned to look after themselves. And uh, so we worked really closely with them, they were our friends. And, uh, and so this is just me hanging out with some of these Hazara kids, but what you can't see, if you look right behind my head, there's a little bit of a shadow, can you guys see that? So that's the shadow of my, my team sergeant, this guy named, his name was Dave Hurt, we used to call him the Big Hurt. He was like a 240 pound beast of a man, like the quintessential Green Beret. He was my hero. Literally he taught me everything that I needed to know about being a good leader in SF. He taught me how to put guys out of aircraft, um, you know, how to be a jump master. He taught me really everything. The guy could, he could literally bench press 450 pounds. He was just an animal. And uh, about two hours after this photo was taken, uh, he was killed in a massive IED moving along a riverbed, trying to secure an objective for the Czech Special Forces that were coming in to do a mission. And this is the last picture I have of him right there, just that little bit of a shadow behind my head. And uh, that's, that's really where things started to change. So this is after, this is afterward. Um, and I'm still trying to work through it here. So we're still on a mission. We'll kind of, we'll kind of come through this, but uh, you know, I lose five of my teammates over the span of two days in February of 2009, and we have to be there till July. So we're, we're doing what green, good Green Berets do. We're getting back on the birds, we're sliding down ropes, landing on targets, blowing off doors, and, and killing bad guys. And this is in the Hellman province. Uh, I'm trying to put a smile on because there's this really beautiful field of poppies behind me, if you guys can see that. And uh, I wanted to take a picture for my wife at the time. I was like, look how awesome these poppies are. Um, the truth is, I, I, my eyes were burning because we'd been up for about 36 hours and uh, I forgot to bring my shaded eye pro because we weren't supposed to be there during the day. Um, but we found all this really great stuff on the objective so the task force commander said stay out there and clear every building in that bazaar. And, uh, and the task force 160th, I don't know if you guys know this, the night stalkers, apparently don't fly during the daytime. <laughs> so if, you, if, you, if you're on an objective at night and you don't wrap up your shit before daylight, you're staying until it's dark again. And so I'm, I'm smoked, and uh, we're actually running, running uh, from some rooftops to get to a, another location here so we could meet some helicopters and go home. And uh, I'm exhausted, but I, I stopped and had one of the DEA guys take this picture of me um, so I could show my wife these poppies. Um, but this is it. This is the face you make, right, when you're just carrying on. You're just driving on. You're just doing your mission. What year was that? This is 2009. This would have been, I don't know, March or April of 2009 probably. Was like, that was not a good year to be in Afghanistan. Not there is one, but that was not a good one. So I alluded to, these, these are my three teammates. Actually, um, over that same period of days, uh, Tim Davis, who was our CCT, our Air Force Special Operations guy, um, he was killed as well as, as one of our, um, our interpreters. His name was Iman Fakhri, who was with us, uh, all killed in a span of, of eight days, one sniper bullet, one IED. And uh, this, that's Dave there on the left, and Mark Small in the middle, and Jeremy Bess on the right. These guys, um, as, well, as you guys know, these, these are like brothers, or even closer than brothers. Um, Nick was saying how all the SF guys live in one neighborhood. You know, they all hang out at the same bar. I didn't spend any time with anybody else at Fort Bragg other than the SF guys, why would you, you know? That's how I felt about it at the time. And, um, and losing these guys hit me pretty hard, but uh, I, didn't have any, I didn't have any room to deal with it. None of us did, because we still had five months left on the deployment, we still had work to do, so you just stuff it. Especially as the commander, I didn't have time for that shit. So I just stuffed it and I never dealt with it. And that's, that's the same three guys. 
And I didn't take this picture because I wasn't there. I was still at the fire base. Charlie Mike. This, this photo was taken by a friend of mine's wife at the memorial at Fort Bragg that you know, none of us on my team even had a chance to go to. So no processing, no dealing with it, no talking about it. There were some rumors at one point that they might send our team home because five, five of the guys on the team had gotten killed, um, which was never true. That was never going to happen. But in talking about it out at the fire base, we agreed, like, we don't, we're not going home. <laughs> I don't want to go home. I want to stay here with you guys. I'm not, I'm not ready to go home and deal with this yet. So I get home later that year, and uh, now it's five, six months since I've lost my teammates. And I show up back at home, and see that little guy right there on my lap? Well, he was, he was, a, uh, he was a fetus at the time that I lost my friends, and so I was pretty convinced at one point I was never gonna meet him. So he's, uh, it's a minor miracle in all reality. I'll spare you like the, the dramatics, but minor miracle that uh, I've, I've ever even gotten a chance to be his dad. And um, I was planning to, to leave the military at the end of 2009. That was my last trip. I'd done everything I joined the Army to do. I'd stayed longer than I planned to stay in the first place. I'd been a platoon leader, a scout platoon leader, and a special forces detachment commander. I'd never been on staff. My life had been pretty awesome. I'd lived the dream. So I come home, and about a week later, Dalton G. is born. And that's my other son, Dylan. He was three at the time, and I'd missed more than half his life. You guys know how that goes. I just wasn't around. And uh, so I get out. But by the time I got home, everybody had already grieved. Everybody had kind of processed the loss. But the guys on my team hadn't. And when we got home, we didn't want to. It was time to be happy. We're glad to be home. Happy to be back with our families. I got a baby being born. I'm, I'm transitioning out of the army. I got a lot of good stuff going on in my life. I don't want to deal with, with that stuff. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pretend like it never happened. And, and as you guys know, that this stuff has a way of catching up with you if you don't deal with it. And so the reason I put this picture here is, um, is be, for, for a couple reasons. One, that guy sucked. I mean, first of all, look at the sandals that I'm wearing. That was, not, that was not a guy that I was real proud of at the time, and, and for a couple of the reasons. Um, one, I, I, was out, I was out of the Army, and I got a job selling medical stuff, and it paid me a lot of money, and I drove a, a Toyota Camry, a company car, and I, and I wore a tie and a suit every day, and I, and I sold stuff to physicians and, and hospitals and surgery centers, and I made a ton of money because I was pretty good at it, um, and I just hated it. I felt like it was soul-sucking. And the truth is, it wasn't the job's fault. It was my fault. I just, I just could not get into it. And I would look in the rearview mirror every day when I'd pull out of my driveway of my big house in my gated golf course community, and I would just say, what the fuck happened to you? I, couldn't, I didn't recognize the guy in the mirror. It certainly wasn't, the, um, certainly wasn't that guy anymore. And I had a really, really hard time reconciling that guy and that guy. But I'll tell you, that guy, I didn't just think he sucked because of his sandals or because of his job or because of his tie. Um, it, it wasn't just that I wasn't him anymore. That hurt me pretty badly. But I, I, didn't, I hadn't just quit sliding down ropes and shooting bad guys. I had quit doing everything that made me this guy. Because you know what else this guy did? And this is something I want everyone to really think about here. This guy wasn't cool because he had a beard or because he had a, a bunch of tabs on his left shoulder. This guy was cool because he was, he was funny. He was a kind father. He was an attentive husband when he was home. He rode a mountain bike. He did triathlon. He lifted heavy weights. He could run a half marathon in an hour and a half. This guy was, was cool for a lot of reasons, not just because he had a beard and flew on CH-47s. And I did, that took me a long time to figure out. And so the problem was, this guy stopped doing all that stuff too. And I felt like I couldn't be the guy that I was anymore. You know, I, I'd, I'd sort of failed on my last mission in Afghanistan. I'd gotten a bunch of my guys killed, which, which didn't feel very good. And then I, then I stepped out of the Army Shortly thereafter, even though it was a kind of a planned withdrawal, it still felt like I'd kind of just failed and quit and gone home. And so I just quit doing everything. And 
And so I'm here trying to be with my family. But if you even look at my posture, I just, that guy just sucked. And so it was, it was Kurt that said the, uh, the nebula collapsing on itself and being reborn. This is, that's what was about to happen right here. Because this guy here wasn't, wasn't nice to his kids, didn't appreciate the nice things he had in his life, resented his big house, resented his big paycheck. His wife was kind of like, hey, I thought it was my turn to like, do some cool stuff now, and that I've been drag- you know, you've been dragging my ass around for 10 years, and uh, that doesn't seem to be happening the way I had planned. Again, going back to expectations. You guys, you two, awesome. Your message needs to get out to more people because my ex-wife and I uh, both really sucked at management of expectations. We're like, we're getting out of the Army. It's going to be awesome. No more deployments. And she's like, now it's going to be my turn, although that was never really voiced to me. You know, we both had these poorly communicated, unrealistic expectations. And those expectations about two years in were not being met. I wasn't meeting hers, life wasn't meeting either of ours, and and my, my uh, nebula was collapsing rather rapidly. And it wasn't because of post-traumatic stress, and it wasn't because of traumatic brain injury, and it wasn't because of a traumatic amputation, it was because I had just lost who I was. I had unreal sex expectations, I had communicated poorly, and I did a lot of the things you're supposed to do well. I got a good job, I, and I, I took my time to try to get a good job when I got out. I didn't screw that up. I got a physical. I made sure I filed for my benefits with the VA. Like, I did a lot of the things that they're going to tell you to do. I didn't screw up hardly any of those things, and I still was screwing it up. And that was, that was really painful for me. And so on, a, on Super Bowl Sunday of 2012, I packed a couple of bags and drove my, my freaking Toyota Camry away from my home, and my wife and my kids, because she asked me to go stay in a hotel and get the hell out of there. And I realized I didn't didn't have anywhere to go. I went from being this guy who had plenty of support, brothers everywhere, could could call on them and they'd they'd be there, they'd pull me out of a burning building. And now here I am, I'm a 31, 32 year old man driving away from his house. I I didn't have anyone in Tampa that I could even call. I didn't have a couch I could crash on. So I just checked into some hotel, ordered some food, watched the Super Bowl, got one as close to the VA as I could because I had determined that that next morning I was going to go in and talk to somebody But what the hell was going on with me. And that began the rebirth. That was my real transition. And from that day forward, it's been a, it's been a pretty good news story. So once I was able to kind of stop, this was in my head the whole time. I just couldn't get these guys out of my head. So I had to go deal with it. So what did I start doing? I started taking some steps. I, I didn't know what to do. There was, no, there was no roadmap for this. So I started doing one thing at a time. And uh, you know, it's not pictured here, but like I said, the first thing I did was I I walked into the VA with my tail between my legs, and I walked up to some nice lady at the front desk, and I said, I need to talk to somebody. And she said, are you enrolled for medical services? And I was like, I I don't think so. And so I went and I talked to somebody, and I got an ID card, and I went through the process, and I said, okay, well, can I go talk to somebody now? And they said, well, we'll we'll get you an appointment, um, but if you want to talk to somebody today, you can go to the urgent care or the ER. And I was like, oh, Jesus. I don't want to do that. That's the last thing a barrel chested Green Bray wants to do is go to the emergency room at the VA hospital and say, I need to talk to somebody. But I, I knew I had to do something. And so I walked, and, and this is another one. I, this is, if you learn nothing from this, this is what matters. A lot of people at that point turn around and leave because they say, this is bullshit. I can't see someone right now. The VA is going to make me get, a, get an appointment. My pride and every fiber of my being wanted just to turn around and get the hell out of there. And I walked my ass down the hallway to the emergency room, even though it wasn't really an emergency. And I went up to the window, and they said, how are you doing, Mr. Smith? What, what can I help you with? And I said, I think I just want to talk to somebody. And then, then what did they say? Do you guys know what they say when you do that? Are you going to hurt yourself? Are you gonna hurt yourself? 
And I'm like, oh, God, I knew I shouldn't have done this. I knew, I knew this was a bad idea. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not, no, damn it. No, I'm not thinking about hurting myself. I'm like, oh, okay. And so I sat there in the waiting room reading a magazine, and they pull me back, and, and I, who do I see? Some, like, ER doctor who like, just does a general intake on me. And he's like, why are you here? I'm like, I just, my marriage is falling apart. You know, I have, I'm having a hard time sleeping. You know, I feel guilty all the time. And he's like, oh, okay. He's like, we're, we got you in for a consult. You know, we'll get you to the post-deployment clinic. And you, you talk to the docs over there. They're great. Um, you know, today, if you want, you can go talk to the chaplain. And I'm not a particularly religious person. And I was like, fine. I'll take whatever I can get. So I marched my ass upstairs, and I sat down with the chaplain. And it was good. It made me feel better. And later that day, one of the VA psychologists called me. He said, hey, Blaine, Dr. Agliata here. Um, got your consult. We got a, looks like you're set up for an appointment next Monday. Just want to make sure you're doing okay. And I was just like, wow. Somebody, somebody gives a crap. This is, this is good. And all this, these horror stories I heard about the VA might not even be true. Holy cow. They're following up with me. I got an appointment on Monday. This is great. And that started to give me hope. Just that one little step. And that was, that was the first step, but I had to take it. I had to get my health in order. That was step one. I had to start taking care of myself. And so the next morning I got up and I went for a run. And I ran every morning until my appointment the next Monday. And, and for me, this isn't for everybody, but for me this became kind of my form of therapy. Just, just emptying the gas tank. You guys know what that is on the right, right? Sweat angel. You, you guys can tell I'm not, not feeling really good there on the left. I didn't take that picture. It's not the most flattering one of me ever, but... I had to get my health in order, my physical health, my mental health, my emotional health. I started, had to start doing what I could do. I couldn't change any decisions that my wife had made. I couldn't change anything that had happened in the past, but I could change the way I dealt with my situation. And I convinced myself that my, my new mission, because I like challenges, and I really hated not having one, frankly, for a couple years, I just decided my new mission is to deal with this crap the best I can. I'm going to be, I'm going to be the bigger person. I'm going to uh, be kind to my wife, soon to be ex-wife, no matter how she treats me. I'm going to deal with a bad situation as best as I can. That's my mission. And it wasn't always easy. I did a lot of biting my tongue. I did a lot of gutting things that I wanted to say. But I just dealt with it the best I could. And it made me feel better every time I made a good choice. And every time I kind of emptied the gas tank. Because I had to get my health in order. And one of the things I started noticing when I started taking a little better care of myself was I started meeting people. And that's the other big component of this is people. Once you can start taking care of yourself and you start to believe in and you start to respect yourself again, you start to think maybe you're worthy of other people caring about you. And I'll be honest with you, my wife was having a relationship with one of her coworkers. She'd kicked me out of the house. I felt like a bad dad. I'd gotten my guys killed on deployment. I was wearing a red tie to work every day. I didn't have a lot of self-confidence. But once I started taking care of myself and getting my health in order, I started feeling more confident being around people. And I had to start taking some other hard steps. I walked down the street from my, my apartment. I, I found a roommate on Craigslist, which was terrifying. I'd been married for 10 years, had a big, nice house. Next thing you know, I'm finding an apartment, a roommate on Craigslist. But I walked down the street. There was this Irish pub that had a running group every, every uh, Tuesday evening. And I'd heard from some people that I should go check it out. And so I walked my happy ass down the street by myself, and I showed up on the back porch of this Irish pub, didn't know anybody, because um, I heard that people met there to run. And I figured I, I probably should make some friends at some point. And it was, it was hard. It didn't feel comfortable. That wasn't my jam. But by the end of the run, I'd bumped into some people, and we chatted, and they were, they were nice people. <laughs> and as it turned out, they actually, they actually kind of liked me. And I started to rediscover, like, I, you know what? I'm not a bad guy. My wife might like her personal trainer more than me, but I'm, I'm handsome. I'm funny. I'm smart. I've done some cool stuff. Like, it really started to change for me oh, very quickly. And I started, you know, working out with some other people. And that started to make a big difference for me. You know, then I started to make some real friends. This guy right here on the right, that's Chuck Newman. He's a, uh, 
he's a former Marine, Scott Sniper. Um, really good dude that I met in Tampa. We spilled a couple of beers together, shared some stories. And I was able to transition then from just knowing some people and having some people in my life to actually having trusted friends, people I could count on, people that would help me move when I finally got a house and got out of the apartment that I found on Craigslist. Pizza and beer helps, but if they're, if they're your friends, they'll still come and help you move. Right? And that's when my life really started to get better, is when I kind of opened up and I allowed myself not just to have these sort of surface level relationships with people at my CrossFit gym or at the running club, but really to put my arm around people and for them, a lot of people them to do the same to me. So my health got better, my community got bigger, and my life started to actually feel pretty rich. And then, like about at least half the people that have been up here today, I found that it was pretty helpful to offer this to other people. So eventually I quit my job in corporate America, and I took about a 70% pay cut. and uh, tightened, the, tightened up the budget a little bit around the house. And I started working for this nonprofit called Team Red, White, and Blue. I was the first employee of this kind of startup nonprofit, and I just started reaching out to other veterans in my community. And then we started building chapters and reaching out to veterans in other communities. And now we're in a, a couple hundred communities around the country. And uh, we started delivering this message of health, people, and purpose. And as you can see, like, my sense of purpose then started to grow. This is, this is a group of folks, actually. I took a lot of pride in this photo because this is at our gym slash office. We had to have an office at some point because we actually started like, being a grown-up organization and like, raising money and like, having employees and stuff. But I didn't really want to have an office, so I just built a CrossFit gym instead. And I tucked a little office in the corner. And we started inviting the community to come in and work out at our office. And uh, this is a group of folks um, from the Wounded Warrior Project in Tampa. And I didn't like them very much when I first showed up, if I can just be honest. Because um, I, I, like, I didn't like the way their programs sounded. And I, I met these people, and uh, they all said, I can't, well, I can't do CrossFit. I heard people get hurt doing CrossFit. Or, uh, you know, Bill's in a wheelchair there. Well, I, I don't know. And I said, come on in. It's functional fitness. We'll just teach you how to move functionally. You know, it'll be, it'll be good for you. And by the end of the workout, the, like, can you see them? Like, someone's on that chick's shoulders. You know, they're all, they're all making muscles, they're sweating. There's like, the guy on the left's like 60 years old. Guess what, they could all do CrossFit. And they were happy. And, this, and I told these people right after this photo was taken, don't let anybody, especially yourselves, tell you that you can't do shit. Because you just proved to yourself today, maybe in a small way, that you can do a lot more than you think you're capable of. And that started giving me my sense of purpose. And that was that last big piece This was at the Army 10 Miler last year in Washington, D.C. We had about 200 folks from Team RW that showed up to uh, run the Army 10 Miler together. And uh, I'll tell you that when it comes to purpose, the, the coolest thing about the organization for me was the most unexpected piece, which I, I thought I was going to be doing a lot of, uh, a lot of this stuff, which is, which is great. I wanted, I wanted to be able to work with veterans one-on-one -on -one and, and really help people with, with what I discovered through the kind of trial and error process that I needed. But this is what I like to call the community of communities. When you really become part of something bigger than yourself, you show up to DC for a, for a race and you just, none of these, hardly any of these people know each other. They came from all over, the, all over the country to run the Army 10 miler, but because they all just wore that same red shirt, they trusted each other. They felt part of a community. They felt part of something larger than themselves, just like the uniform we used to wear when we were soldiers or Marines or sailors or airmen, and, uh, and they feel connected. That's a big, big deal. And so for me, the question becomes, once you've kind of gained it back, how do you stay there? I, I don't forget who it was. One of the presenters earlier today talked about getting out of the hole is one thing, but it's, it's pretty obvious when you're in the hole that, that you suck. And so you take steps to like get yourself out. It just makes sense. But the real challenge, I think, for, for those of us is once you've gotten yourself back up to kind of level ground, and you got your head above water, whatever you want to call it, how do you keep making those incremental steps? How do, you keep, how do you keep with those things that got you to a better place? And you go from just kind of surviving to really thriving. 
Because that's what I want for myself, and that's what I want for kind of everybody in this room and all of our brothers and sisters, is I don't want veterans to get out of the military and do okay. Like, we're a pretty extraordinary bunch of people. I want for us to get out and kick ass and to be leaders in our community, to be coaches and teachers and business leaders. And So how do you, how do you take that step? So for me, it's been about how do I keep my sense of purpose? And just for me personally, it's about taking it from bigger and trying to save the world to getting it really, really small. And so the, through the process, years after I was divorced and after I started to like make friends again, and I took care of myself, and I became the kind of person I was proud of, magically, I show up to the 6 a.m. CrossFit class at my gym that I went to religiously every morning, and this chick showed up. And she knew that I had a couple of little boys that came around occasionally and jumped on boxes and swung kettlebells at the gym. And she thought I had used, you know, maybe I was in the military before and I had this old crappy beat up truck because that's all I could afford. And as it turned out, she was an army officer and had been deployed and had gone to military school and had been divorced. And uh, I had done my work. And so the good things started to come into my life when I was ready for them, when I had done my work, when I was worthy of them. Yeah. Yeah, and so, and so this, this amazing Army veteran, CrossFitter, supermodel shows up in my life. That's my son, Dalton. He's a little bigger now. And this is him following me because, uh, as Kurt said, we're leaders in our family, right? And you don't want to tell people what to do. You want to lead them to what to do. And so this is my son engaging in a little physical fitness out there involved in his community just hanging out with dad. That's Dylan on the right, and that's Dalton again on the left. That's them at the end of the Savage Race in Dade City, Florida. Just, just being little badasses like they are, crawling through the mud. Look how happy they are. Look at, so Dylan's showing him his medal. Dalton's wearing the same medal, by the way, around his neck. This is my favorite part of the story. Is Dylan is showing Dalton his medal, which, which he also has, and he's like, wow. Dylan, your medal is so cool. You earned it. But to think of, just look at the joy. You know, this is the, these are the things that start to happen when we get our lives in order and we focus on the small things. So this is, this is my mission now is to really just to lead my family. And that is Penelope. She's eight months old. She is the light of my life. She's an absolute bundle of joy. That's my gorgeous wife, Jenny, who just had an eight-month-old baby, which you can't tell in the photo, but... And that guy, in the, in the blue shirt right there, that guy doesn't suck. I might not be a lot of things, and I'm not going to stand up here and brag, but uh, I will tell you that I don't suck. I get up every morning, I tell my wife that I love her, and I get to the gym, or I go run a few miles, usually with Penny in the jogging stroller because she doesn't sleep that well. So she's my training partner a lot of days. But it's not hard for me to have a smile on my face. Um, it's not hard for me to feel deserving of this. Uh, because I know now that back when I wore the uniform, I, I did my best. I did the best I could every single day. On the good days and on the bad days and on the days where I lost my teammates, I was just, I was just doing the best I could. And the enemy gets a vote sometimes. Shit just doesn't work out the way you hoped, the way you expected. You know, I used to say when I joined the Army, I experienced a lot of stuff that wasn't in the brochure. And I spent too long feeling like I didn't deserve that. And maybe for a while I didn't. But if you can focus on your health, on the people around you, and on finding that sense of purpose, and it doesn't have to be in your job, by the way. Don't just go quitting your job because it doesn't like, feel as good as being a helicopter pilot or a marine sniper. It's probably never going to. Figure out some other way to find some purpose in your life. It's okay. There, there are other ways. But if you can focus on that and get yourself right, you're going to be so much better for the people around you, and you're going to be 100% deserving 
of this and, and so much more. So I'll just kind of leave you with what Kurt said. Once you get that head above water and you start to feel real good, don't sabotage yourself. It can still get better. Keep doing the things that you were doing. My old basketball coach used to say, when you run a play and it works, run it again. You run it until they stop you. So just stay with it. And uh, if there's anything I can do to help, anybody that's here in this room um, or any of your friends or family or anybody, our website is teamrwb.org. You can go there and sign up. It's free. Like I said, there's chapters in over 200 cities now across the country. And that's my personal email address and my personal cell phone number. So if I can help, I'm honored to be here and, uh, and happy to help. Thanks, guys.